Amen. Amen. Miss Winnie, you want to tell them why you love that song? So, for those who might not know, when Sandy Kay was born, she was born on February 14th. It was a, it was a emergency on um, birth, and um, I went into labor six weeks early and rushed to Sampson. They couldn't get me out of Sampson in time. They tried to get me to Fayetteville or to Wilmington. Couldn't happen. She just came too quickly. And then when she was born, they knew something was wrong. Um, it was immediate. Um, right there in the emergency room in the OR, we knew something was wrong. So they put her in a separate room at Sampson Regional. Um, they didn't have a, a NICU at Sampson Regional. And we stayed there. And the third day, they said, Mama, you got to go, but she's got to stay. And I remember when I left that hospital, I was so upset. Mamas are not supposed to leave their, ho their babies at the hospital. It's not right. Um, and I sat in her nursery alone in tears and I had Christian music playing through the house and this song came on and when this song came on the spirit descended upon the house at Pinehurst Lane and I was okay I was calm because that's what the Holy Spirit does he's a comforter even though I had to leave my baby at the hospital to come to find out they had to airlift her to Greenville because a, a doctor came in and said this baby's got to go through all of that, I was okay because I was not alone. So every time I sing that song, I remember whatever may be happening, I'm not alone. We can sing it one more time. Just the, you amaze me. You, you amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as one more time. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. You amaze me, redeem me. You call me as your own. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. I am not alone. I am not alone. You will go before me. You will never leave me. Every time I sing that line, you will go before me, I think about growing up. There's certain situations in the middle of the night, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, somebody banged on the house door. There was never any thought in my mind who was going to answer the door. You know who jumped up and answered the door? My daddy. Growing up, my daddy answered the door that time. Anytime something dangerous was getting ready to happen, Miss Marcy, I'm going to pick on you. Anytime something dangerous was getting ready to happen, my daddy would go, uh-uh, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. He went before me. Are you listening? Are you paying attention? And if you, even, if you love your children or you even have some kids you kind of like, you'll occasionally go, no, 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 let me do that. Let me do that. Let me do that. If anybody's going to get hurt, it's going to be me. So the next time Satan bangs on your door, let Jesus answer it. Because he will go before you. He'll be the one who protects you and guides you and keeps you. He is called the great shepherd, implying that there are less shepherds. Be careful who shepherds your heart. Miss Marcy, come here, girl. So, y'all have heard me say this on Wednesday night. A couple times, and I don't want to give the enemy any inch, not a, not a millimeter, not a centimeter, but every time, I've been here 10 years in April, okay, so we're getting close, and I've noticed something. You going to come up here with us? Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, honey. Yes, baby. Uh, every time we get around 80, 20 or 30 people get mad and leave, or we're not going to let it happen again. 
I got two or three people believing. We're not going to let that happen again. <laughs> and, and I wasn't going to bring it up, but, and I didn't ask Marcy to do this, but she, wants to, she came forward. The Holy Spirit told her, <laughs> told her to come up here and pray for our, our church and pray for everybody in this church to not believe one lie of the enemy. And if you hear something and you think, I can't believe they did that, come talk to me. Don't give the enemy a centimeter. Because obviously God wants to do something great or hell wouldn't get so mad when we get to around 80. <laughs> so we're getting into short rows again, and I need you two or three to agree with me, but they're not going to let it happen again. Amen? Amen. So stretch your hands this way. Go ahead, Marcy. Yes. Amen. Right. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Yes. Amen. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly right. Amen. So get your faith out there. Let's pray for Marcy. She prays for our church. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, for protecting your church, Lord. You are the head of this church, and we want, Father, to bring glory, honor, and praise into your name. We thank you, Lord, for the unity of the faith. Lord, that we, that we will decrease and you will increase. Thank you, Father Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for giving us grace and mercy, protecting us and leading and guiding us, Father, in paths of righteousness. For your name's sake, Lord, protect your church, lead and guide your church, be with your church, go before us, Father, as we want to lift up and honor and praise and glorify the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We thank you, Father. For all you've done and all you're going to do, we thank you, Lord, for blessing us and helping us, leading us and guiding us. Thank you, Lord, for your people agreeing in faith. Where two or three are gathered together in your name, there you're in the midst of them. Thank you for your protection, your grace, and your mercy. And lead us, Father, to what you want to bless. And that's not just to do something and ask you to bless it, Father. We thank you, Father, for the heart of God and for those who want to protect your church. For your glory, your praise, and your honor. In Christ's name, amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for coming forward. Amen. Amen. Give me fives. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, this morning, I'm going to start a new winter sermon theme of death to the selfie generation we live in. Oh, i got to dismiss the children. Um, Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5 says, Children are our heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward like the heirs in the hands of the warrior. So are the children of one's youth. Happy is a man who has his quiver full of them. We will never finish today, but we will get started. Um, part of the problem of what's going on in, in not the world, I'm talking about the church, and the Bible has a lot to say about it. That's why I chose to start talking about it is the love and glorification of our self. And I've got a funny video um, that I found years ago that I want to play to start this sermon series with. Mr. Jeremy, go ahead, please. It's all about me, really. It is all about you. Now, the greatest collection of me worship ever assembled on one CD. It's all about how I lift my name on high. All 20 songs, all about you. This amazing collection is great to share with friends, if you have any. Everyone can join in the worship with you, for you, and about you. 
because you are unique and you love you. There is none like me. No one else All this can for do only $19.95. Like Operators do. are standing by to serve you. And I am why I sing. And I am why I live. If you order now, you'll also receive a second CD and of I Yule Tide Favorites. I sing. No, come Call 1 800 Me, Me, Me. Or order online at me, myself, and I dot com. Call today because no one can praise you like you. Anybody know those songs? <clears throat> In the book of John, chapter 3. conversation happens. <laughs> there arose a discussion on the part of John's disciples with the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, John the Baptist, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you testified, behold, he is now baptizing and all are coming to him. John the Baptist answered his disciples and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves are my witnesses that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been full. He must increase, but I must decrease. I didn't read the whole chapter, but what happened was Jesus started getting popular after John. When I said popular, I want you to understand that's air quotes. Jesus started getting popular after he was baptized by his cousin John the Baptist. And John the Baptist had disciples, and they came to him and said, Teacher, the one you baptize is pulling people away from us. They're taken from our church. And John said, I told you from the get-go I'm not the Christ. And I told you from the get-go I am preparing the way for the Christ. And no one can receive anything like that unless God gives it to him. And the, the, the jumping off verse for today is that last verse in John 3. He must increase. And I must decrease. Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, anoint lips of clay to bring you glory, honor, and praise, to rightly divide the word of God for your glory. In Christ's name, amen. We love capturing moments. It started out thousands of years ago with oral tradition, passing down stories that were told specifically word for word by elders to the next generation, to their children, and then their children. Eventually, we began writing, and we began agreeing upon. Have you ever thought about, I'm not going to go into a great deal of, of, of controversy about it, but at some point, a, at least more than two people got together and agreed, we're going to call this a lid. You know, nobody calls this a dingle hopper, right? There's your Little Mermaid reference, right? We, we all, but, but if you travel a certain amount of mileage, you don't pronounce lid as lid. You pronounce it another way. Don't ask me how to say it. Um, but, uh, so we all gathered together, and we went from oral tradition that was very strict to written tradition and passed down to paintings and drawings and then statues and then memorialized in oil and canvas and stones. But then fast forward to the last 250, 300 years in our history. The earliest known surviving photo is called View from the Window at a city in La Grasse, France. It was taken somewhere between 1827 uh, and 1826. Um, this is the first, this is the only, this is the oldest known recorded, uh, excuse me, this is the oldest one we know about. 
uh, view from the window is some, somewhere in 1826, 1827. The first color photo is called Tartan Ribbon, was taken by James Clerk Maxwell in 1861, and this photo was the first time color photo was taken. There are three colors in this photo. Now, when you fast forward to today, now understand when I say this, some of you do not have, do not do this. That's why I'm using the word average. Fast forward to today, the average person has around 2,500 photos on their phone. I remember, uh, Miss Ruth, this is why I'm not a millionaire or a billionaire. I remember when they first came out with phones with cameras on them, I thought, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. I want a phone to make a call. I do not want a phone to take a picture. I've changed my mind. How many of y'all are old enough to remember, like, there's three photos of you? Somebody might have showed up because if you had a camera back before everyone had one on their phone, it was a big, fat, hairy deal to have a camera. You remember that? Y'all remember big events. Who's bringing, who's bringing the camera? Who's bringing? Have you got enough film? And you remember, then you remember those little, those little one tens you could slip in your pockets with a little chicka, 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 chick. You couldn't, you couldn't use a flash. I mean, the flash was this big on top of something like that. But cameras were a big, fat, hairy deal. And a lot of y'all, if you have more than two siblings, there's some of y'all ain't got no pictures of, you, of, of none of you. Because mom and them took two or three pictures of them when they were born and two or three pictures of them at Tweetsie Railroad probably or at the beach and two or three pictures maybe when they graduated and by the third or fourth child, they forgot to bring the camera. Anybody no, I'm talking about there's four or five photo albums, and some of them got two pictures in there, y'all. Right? Nowadays, people are a little overboard with pictures, right? The average person has 2,500, and the average person of that 2,500, 58% are considered selfies. Now, if you don't know what a selfie is, it's a photo taken for the exact purpose of putting yourself in the forefront of the picture. So of that 2,500, approximately 58% are selfies. Somewhere around, if you, if you got your calculator, 1.5 trillion photos are taken each year, and it is estimated to be 2.3 trillion by 2030. The average person takes about 20 photos per day, or about 4.7 billion per day are taken are all around the world. That means somewhere around 12.4 trillion photos have been taken through history, and by 2030, it will be close to 30 trillion. The average person takes more than 450 selfies each year. Now, why did I bring that up? I recognize that I have a problem. I love myself. I currently have around 12,000 photos on my phone. Uh, now, while all of all of this, excuse me, but all of this information has a reoccurring theme. Most of it revolves around the glorification and the edification of other men and women and the self. Do you? I didn't look up the stats for this. Every year at Yellowstone, people are mauled and killed by animals that weigh thousands of pounds because they think it's a good idea to get out of the car and stand in front of a buffalo and take a selfie. They stand in front of a bear with cubs. They think it's okay to jump out of the safari truck and walk over to that fresh dead antelope. I wonder where he came from. Most of the photos that people take nowadays revolve around the glorification and edification of either other men and women or ourself. We are naturally born and inclined to put ourselves first. If you want me to prove it to you, if I were to take a group photo here today, you wouldn't care if my eyes were closed. But you would care if your eyes was closed. When you see a group photo, you're not looking to see what everybody else looks like. Who are you looking for? 
Tell the truth. Shame the devil. You're looking for yourself. And if you look like you're wearing a garbage bag and everybody else looks good, you're going to be mad as a wet sitting hen. You want to get everybody back together and take a photo, don't you? We're naturally inclined to put ourselves first. We're always worried about if we're going to get recognition. We always worry about how we look in the picture. But the Bible says Christ is supposed to deliver us, to, is supposed to deliver us from ourself. And much like the opening scripture from John the Baptist, who clearly said he was not the Christ, but made it abundantly obvious Christ must increase and he must decrease. Unfortunately, this theme, and I got this artwork from Pastor Craig Rochelle. This theme of death to ourself is not an isolated incident. This theme is seen all throughout the gospel in the entire Bible. That God alone deserves glory for everything. Even things we do all by ourselves. Listen, you have never pulled yourself up by your own bootstraps. Everything you have is because of the grace of God. Deuteronomy 8.18, one of my favorite stewardship verses says, Remember the Lord your God who gives you the ability to make wealth. Because without the breath God lets you borrow, you're, not even, you're, you're just a clay pot, right? So, so you've done nothing all by yourself. You are dependent on God whether you know it or not. For the Christian, the word of God is clear. Take up your cross and follow him. The cross is an instrument of death. You understand if Christ would have died in 2020, 2022, 2020, that the, it might have been an electric chair. It might have been a lethal injection syringe. But for, 2000, for over 2,000 years, that was an instrument of death. But now it is a part of our artwork. It is, a, it is a thing of beauty because that which the enemy meant for bad, are you listening? God used for his glory. Christ calls his disciples to take up their cross. What does that mean? Watch this video very quickly. What does it mean to take up my cross daily? Jesus says in Luke 9 verse 23, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. From this we can understand that to take up my cross is a requirement to be Jesus' disciple and it must happen daily. The first people's disobedience to God's commandment is known as the fall. They now had a flesh, which means that they had come into opposition towards God. All people have inherited this flesh, and this influences our thoughts, words, and actions. When I give my life to Jesus, I commit myself to stop serving sin and doing my own will, and to start serving God. So I have decided no longer to agree to the lusts and desires that come from my flesh. But my new mind doesn't mean my flesh has changed. I quickly notice that my lusts are very much alive, and I still get tempted. This is why I need to take up my cross daily. We'll get back to that later. The cross was a common method of punishment by the Romans who ruled during Jesus' time. No one could hang on a cross and live. After suffering for a period of time, death finally came. So what does taking up my cross actually mean? To take up my cross is something that takes place in my mind. When thoughts that aren't pleasing to God come to my mind during the day, I deny them and put them to death on an inner cross. So taking up my cross is basically to say no to my own self-will and lusts when I am tempted. It hurts to deny the sinful thoughts that I naturally tend to think and which are in opposition to God's will, even if my whole desire is to do what's pleasing to God. Taking up my cross causes suffering for my flesh, which doesn't get what it wants. The Bible calls this suffering in the flesh, and the Apostle Peter writes, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. 1 Peter 4 verse 1 The Holy Spirit gives me the strength to remain hanging on the cross, to keep saying no to the demands of my flesh until the lusts die. Then I truly become free from sin. As a human being, my flesh is full of selfishness. That is why Jesus says that I have to deny myself and take up my cross every day, all my life. As I use this cross day by day, bit by bit I'm overcoming sin and becoming more like Jesus. Life gets better and better when I'm no longer bound to reacting the way I used to, and it also gets better for others to be around me.
I decided to speak hey, on. Hey, we hope you enjoyed this episode of we Bible did. Quotes Thank Explained. Thank you so much. I decided to do this sermon theme for several reasons. I figured since it was the first of the year, whether you acknowledge it or not verbally, many of you have made resolutions to keep for 2024. I've noticed for most of us, our resolutions are self-centered in nature because we are madly in love with ourselves. And while it is wise to be a good steward of the self God has let you borrow, we have to be very careful not to slip into stewardship of the self God lets us borrow, to slip into worshiping the self. So I challenge you today, go through your phone and who are what the majority of the pictures, who are they of? I've noticed that there's nothing wrong with wanting to lose weight or be a better person, but with the leading of the Holy Spirit, we must be very careful to avoid making any goal that makes us, that, that revolves around making us happy as Christians. Watch this. Um, I think it was Pastor Gary, um, uh, uh, it'll come to me in a minute. He said, what if Christ did not call you to be happy, but he called you to be holy? Gary Thomas, thank you. Pastor Gary Thomas. What if he didn't call you to be happy, but he called you to be holy? Now, you can be happy in holiness, but what if the ultimate end goal of you getting saved was not about your eternal happiness? Because you can have joy for the journey and not be happy about your circumstances. How many of y'all know, no matter how much you love the summertime, January's coming? It's going to snow every couple of years in our area or, or a heavy ice storm every two or three years. No matter how much you love 100 degrees and the beach, it's going to be cold and nasty. Seasons come to pass is the point I'm trying to make. And you can have the same joy for the journey and be very careful that your goals are not only about just making you happy because your happiness is not God's first priority. Your happiness is not God's first priority. For example, when was the last time you asked God what he, you want, he wanted you to do instead of asking God to do something you want to do? When was the last time you asked God in your daily prayer time? And notice I said daily. When was the last time you read your Bible and said, Lord, what does that mean to me and not think, boy, I sure do hope Sister Sam Bucket hears that in the next sermon. No, what does it mean to you? Instead of bringing a shovel to church, I sure, Fred, I'm going to pick on you. I sure hope Fred heard that while Kim was preaching because he sure was talking about Fred. I want you to bring a bucket and say, mm, I need to take that home with me. I need to take that sermon point home with me. Lord, you done told me to put that in my bucket to take home with me. Instead of a shovel, a bucket. Because watch this, Jesus said, if you worried about the two before sticking out of your eye, you wouldn't worry about the piece of dirt in somebody else's eye. When was the last time you asked God what he wanted you to do instead of asking God to do something you want to do? As a matter of fact, if you'll listen to when I, we have prayer time, when Miss Marcy came up, I specifically pray this way, Lord, lead us, listen, this, is, this can be very slippery, listen to this. Lord, lead us to do what you want to bless and not just us do something in your name and ask you to bless it. Because there's a lot of stuff that's good that God don't want us to do. If we're not called to do something, we should not do it and just ask God to bless it. We should do what he leads us to do and he will bless what he leads you to do. When was the last time you asked that? Instead of saying, dear God, please make me richer. When the truth of the matter is, it's not an income problem, it's a spending problem. Because all of us know, I got this from Bishop Tony Miller, if you're, at, if, you're, if you're spending, if you're outgoing is more than your income, your upkeep will be your downfall. Okay. It doesn't matter if you make $10,000 a year or $100,000 a year. If you spend $100 more a year than you bring in, you are in the hole $100. And this was in my stewardship lesson, but I'm going to throw it in there extra free of charge just to make you happy. Just because you can afford the payments does not mean you can afford it. Okay. 
Instead of saying, Lord, make me richer, when was the last time you said, Lord, open my spiritual eyes to show me how I can be a better steward of everything you let me borrow? Because the Bible says if you're not faithful in little, you're not going to be faithful in much. Is that not what the Bible says? You want a million dollars, but you can't handle minimum wage. Instead of praying, Lord, make me happier, how about saying, Lord, can you reveal to me why I'm so unhappy? But spoiler alert, bud, watch this, spoiler alert. When you pray that, you're not going to like the answer because he's going to tell you. And it's going to sound a lot. It's going to sound a lot like the stuff that your flesh really loves. But how many of y'all know? If you eat lobster every day, eventually it'll taste like a bar of soap, right? If you drink enough alcohol, eventually it's not going to satisfy. You take enough uh, uh, illegal substances, eventually you're going to wake up dead. It's not going to satisfy. You do enough of whatever it is that your flesh says will make you happy, you find out it will not make you happy. How many of you have lived life long enough to know whatever that is, when you get that, it is never enough? When the honeymoon wears off, it's the next thing, right? The next thing. And while there's nothing wrong with wanting, Mr. Brian, God made us to want, God made us to crave. There's nothing wrong with that. He made us to. But when we make it a God unto serving ourself, then that is a sin. And lust, when I say lust, everybody thinks about the flesh of a man and a woman together. But lust is when you make up your mind, you will never be happy until you have that thing that your mind is set on. You dream about it. You think about it. You save every penny, nickel, and dime. You pick up pop bottles beside the road. You pick up cans beside the road. You save and you scrimp and you sacrifice and you go in debt to get that thing. That is lust. Instead of saying, God, give me everything I want, have you considered praying, Lord, give me the wisdom to be a good steward with everything I already have? Because we all have imaginary lines that we will not cross, right? I joked about one of the nurses I used to work with, Lynn, I don't know if you've been here before. We were sitting there looking through the Piggly Wiggly paper years ago, and um, she said, good gracious, two liter drinks is $1.25. dollar twenty-five." I ain't paying a dollar for twenty five for a two liter, and I said her name. I'm just gonna say Linda. I'm gonna pick on Linda. I said Linda, twice a day at break time, you put a dollar in that machine. This is a twenty ounce drink. You get a two liter for a dollar twenty five. Well, that's different, huh? Yeah. Listen, Linda. Listen, listen. That was her imaginary line, right? She did not mind paying a dollar for twenty ounces, but she wasn't gonna pay a dollar twenty five for two liters. And if you're doing the math, the math ain't mathing. There's places that the Lord can reveal things to you, but they're going to hurt. Because you're not going to want to do it. Because it makes yourself happy. And when you pray those prayers and they don't happen, God make me rich, God make me happy, God give me everything I want. When they don't happen, people blame God. I have heard the people Ken, I tithed for two weeks, and I couldn't see a difference, so I quit. That's like the people who take medication and say, I took um, medication for heart palpitations for two weeks, and I didn't feel like it was working, so I quit taking it. Hello. Hello. What are you consistently doing? Because what you consistently do is what's going to add up to make a difference. What are you consistently doing? What are the habits? When people say things like, I tried God and he didn't work. Maybe it's because you think God is a genie in a bottle. You can just pick it up and say, oh, God, oh, Lord, I know that you're the God of the universe and give me everything I want. Amen. That's not how it works. Too many people, including professing Christians, think God exists for their pleasure and their comfort. God does not exist exclusively for your pleasure and your comfort. If he does, then he owes the Apostle Paul an apology. 
If he does, he owes lots of other disciples an apology. So he does not exist for your comfort and your pleasure alone. Humanity exists to serve and honor him as creator. Contrary to what many Christians are being taught or at least being implied to them, Jesus said we are to take up our cross and follow him daily if we want to be his disciples. See, everybody wants the promises of God without paying the price. We all want the promises, but we don't want to pay the price. And that is a natural human reaction. That's the first thing I want to know. When I'm going to go buy something, I want to know what? How much is this? I don't want to know how many, how many payments I can break it into. I don't want to know what special finances are available. I want to know your best cash, what I call OTD, out the door. And if it's a real big event, uh, ODD, out the door. I want to know what's your best cash OTD on this right now. Because I want to know how much is this going to cost me. And you, I don't ever answer the question, what kind of payment are you looking for? I say zero. That's what kind of payment I'm looking for. Or I want to finance $75. Can you do that? I want to know how much is it going to cost me. And humanity does not want to, I've mentioned this before, we have an, un, we have an irresistible urge for certain things like water. Have you ever been so thirsty I love Dot Mountain Dew. If Charlie was here, he'd be waving a hanky at me. We, we love Dot Mountain Dew, Mr. Charlie, Miss Faye. We love Dot Mountain Dew. As a matter of fact, Miss Faye gave me his Dot Mountain Dews after the funeral, and, and I enjoyed every one of them. Thank you, Miss Faye. Um, she said, I can't think of anyone better to give it to. I said, hallelujah. I'll go get him out your car. But watch this. When I'm really thirsty, I don't want a Mountain Dew. I don't want a Pepsi Cola. I don't want an RC. You know what I want? Water. At our bare, natural, down to the bottom line, we have a natural hunger and thirst for certain things. Water is one of those, right? We crave in certain situations water, right? In certain circumstances, water. When we are at a certain point of hunger, you know if you go through certain situations or circumstances, if, if like say, for example, you go through the, the nausea vomiting bug, you probably your first meal ought not to be barbecue and fried chicken, right? Right? Your body craves the, they used to call it the brat diet. They still call it brat. They still call it bread, rice, stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. It's plain, bland, crackers. Uh, you know what I'm talking about, Sprite. Anybody? Bob Barker, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> used to, uh, saltines and Sprite and Bob Barker used to get you through your stomach bugs, stuff like that. You don't start with barbecue. We have a, so spiritually, we have a hunger for truth. But we don't like the way it tastes, Kimberly. We don't like how it tastes in our mouth, but we're hungry for it. And let me prove it to you. When somebody is really blowing somebody else out and giving them the what for and everything they're saying about them is true, you're thinking, yeah, you tell them, absolutely, they need to hear that. But you don't want nobody to do that to you. You have a hunger for truth. You're like, yeah, you tell them. That's the only reason them silly shows exist on daytime television. Are you the father or are you not the father? The DNA results are in. And some of them youngins, you know, you could look, Helen Keller could look at that youngin and tell who he belongs to. You know what I'm talking about? We have a hunger for truth, but we don't like how it tastes in our mouth. So what are you going to ask God for that's not selfish? Because we are called to take up his cross and follow him. We understand here that we have to pay the price, but we're not willing to, to, do, to do it here. We understand with a head knowledge, but as, as a heart knowledge. So, watch this. Here's some, here's some red flags for you. Quit saying, Ken's not preaching, so I ain't going to church today. Quit saying, I'm mad at the church. I'm mad at the denomination, so I'm going to stop paying my tithes. Yeah, you've really taught God a lesson. Quit saying, um, I could 
help on Wednesday night meals, but I'm not going to. I'm going to show up at the last minute. I'm going to eat. I'm going to let somebody else clean it behind me, and I'm going uh, to go home. Quit saying, I don't like that. If it's, if it's unbiblical or heretical, I under, totally understand. But you understand, preferences are not the truth. And the truth is not preferences, right? Let's major on the majors and minor on the minors. I've, I've mentioned this before, and it's the truth. If all of y'all kind of came to me and there's a general consensus, Ken, we're all excited about it, and we got, we're going we're gonna to pay Jimmy to do it, and we want to paint the walls purple, and we're going to put glitter in the paint. I'm going to say, how much is it going to cost us? You know, and y'all tell me, well, we've already raised the money and we got the highest end paint. I'm going to say, knock yourself out. That's not my preference. I prefer you not paint it purple, but it's not my church. You understand? I'm the pastor of this church. Now, the bishop may call me and say, why did you let them people paint them walls purple? I'm going to say the whole church got together and they were fired up about it, bishop, and they paid for it. So why couldn't they paint it purple? I don't care. I can't tell you how much I don't care. But if somebody comes walking in here, and they don't look like you, and they don't act like you, and they don't smell like you, and they're not the same color as you, and they don't talk like you, and if you treat them wrong, or you treat them bad, or you treat them ugly, that's a big deal to me, right? When the LGBTQ community starts coming to our church, how are you going to treat them? That's a big deal, right? Because all of, all of us have sin in our life, right? Anybody here sinless? Right? So we're going to ask them to use the restroom of your birth. Okay? You may feel like a woman, but, but if you have male plumbing, we'd like for you to use the male restroom. Just in case y'all don't know, those are conversations that we have to have now so you don't freak out when you see a, a man with a dress going into men's restroom. We all agree. You're going to use the plumbing that you were born with, that you currently have. Okay? None of us are perfect. The truth is the love of Christ. I'm not going to allow couples to make out in the sanctuary, but I'm not going to allow a, a man and a woman to do it either. Right? We have standards of conduct for certain situations, and that is not acceptable in a public display, in a public, a public assembly building. Right? We, we, we are against certain things, and we are for certain things, but we all agree what is the truth of the matter. What is at the very bottom of it? What are we asking God to do? Instead of, I can't believe they're coming to this church. Instead of that saying, Lord, how can you use me to show them the love of Christ? And as the days and the weeks and the years draw closer to the returning of Christ, you understand Jesus didn't travel with the religious people of his day. Jesus traveled with the misfits, the throwaways, the unlearned. Peter cussed like a sailor, literally. Right? It is the those that have the least in the world's eyes, it seems. Now, do, do, do rich and powerful people need Christ? Amen. Do people that you don't think deserve need Christ too? Yes, because you know why? I didn't deserve him. And I was lost and undone without God and his son. Today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray. I want you to bow your heads, and I want you to listen to the words I'm saying, and I want you to pray them in your own way. Lord, in Jesus' name, call me to an accounting. Lord, in Jesus' name, call me into repentance of my narcissism and complacency. Lord, in Jesus' name, call me into an account for my selfishness and lead me to grow in the knowledge and the grace of Christ. Lord, in Jesus' name, forgive me for being rebellious about what you want me to do and how you want me to do it in the church I'm supposed to be a part of. Lord, in Jesus' name, I know you're coming soon. And I don't want to wake up in hell or miss the rapture just because I was selfish, just because I was self-centered, just because I was not willing to obey you. Father, in Jesus' name, forgive me of my sins as I forgive those who sin against me. And lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. We thank you, Father. Forgive me 
and lead me into paths of righteousness for your name's sake. Lord, forgive me of being selfish. Forgive me of being self-centered. Forgive me for being rebellious. Forgive me of my narcissism. Forgive me, Lord, of the glorification of myself. And help me, Lord, to lift up, to honor and praise you and serve you as you increase and I decrease. Now, if there's somebody here who doesn't know Christ and you'd like to receive him before you go, I'd love to meet you at the front. Is there anybody here today? Then, Lord, I pray you've led me to do with what you want me to do with the time you've given me to do it in. I pray, Lord, you bless and move upon the people that are sounding my voice and bring them back the next appointed time. And we'll give you glory, praise, and honor for it in Christ's name. And everybody said amen. Shake hands with two or three people and say, we'll see you Wednesday night.